Hello, everybody. Welcome to another live stream Face by podcast. Today, Dr. Daniel McClellan returns to the show. We're going to be talking about one of his other articles called Larry Hurtado on Early Jewish Monotheism. Welcome back to the podcast, Dr. McClellan. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Um, thank you for coming on. So what? Um, if you could briefly explain to the audience, for those that may not be aware of this, um, what were Larry Hurtado's views on early Jewish monotheism? Well, Larry Hurtado famous, uh, published a very influential book called One God, One Lord. And one of the things he argued in there was that, <clears throat> and in a number of other publications around that time period that he's developed since, is that we should not be looking for monotheism in first century Judaism as a belief in one, the existence of only one God, uh, because that's complicated by a number of, of different intermediary figures and other entities that could be referred to in first century Jewish literature as deities, as gods. But what he argues is that we need to take the exclusive worship of one single deity as the essence of monotheism and to understand uh, Judaism's treatment of <clears throat> the God of Israel as the only God in the sense that they were the only God that was worthy of worship and therefore the only God that they were allowed to worship as the indication of their monotheism. And then he uses this primarily to uh, segue into discussion of the development of early Christology, arguing that the worship of Jesus that developed following Jesus's resurrection reflects what he called a mutation um, uh, in the nature of that one God worship, in that suddenly there was this other figure that did not violate the first century Jewish monotheism, but uh, was an addition to it. So it was it was um, what he refers to as this mutation, but it happened quickly enough that it seems to have been the product of, of some significant event in the lives of the communities that, uh, that were focused on Jesus. Uh, and so he's a member of what people have, uh, or he was a member, he's tragically passed away uh, a few years ago, uh, but he was a member of what people referred to as the early high Christology club, the notion that Jesus's identification with God in, uh, if not a Trinitarian sense, then at least in a strict monotheistic sense, was something that took place very quickly uh, before even the writing of the New Testament, as opposed to others who would say that Jesus's relationship with God changed over time slowly as uh, Christians developed a concept of Jesus's divinity uh, and more fully fleshed it out. So in, in short, it is that monotheism should be understood to be first century Judaism's uh, sole worship of one single deity uh, that then led into this mutation that resulted in the um, additional worship of Jesus that was not considered a violation of that monotheism. Why did Larry believe that, the, um, that these more advanced theological thoughts, such as the Trinity, um, started out? far earlier than others believe? That's a that's a, an interesting question. He was critical of a lot of the scholars who tried to read Trinitarianism, Trinitarianism directly into first century uh, Christianity, but he did seem to want to try to find a way to um, kind of align with what Richard Balcom has called uh, divine identity Christology, this notion that Jesus didn't violate monotheism because Jesus was included in the divine identity of God. Now, Balcom doesn't directly say this is Trinitarianism because it's the one being of God constituted by three different persons within that one being. He, he doesn't go that far, but it is clearly setting the table for that. And I think that Hurtado is a little more critical than Balcom in that he's not ready uh, to say that strict monotheism was was just this concept of belief in one, the existence of only one God, but wanted to use mo uh, worship as the um, <clears throat> the vector, the criterion for trying to see how Judaism could be monotheistic and and early Christians who initially were Jewish folks could accommodate this additional figure. 
Um, and so I still see it as a means of, of trying to find at least the seeds of the Trinity uh, in first century Christianity, but it is, it is definitely more critical than some of the other uh, more apologetic, uh, more devotional, less critical approaches that I think are out there. So why would he, why would he criticize others for trying to read the Trinity into the New Testament, but in the end of the day, he defended the idea that it was early? Well, I think there is um, the devotional approaches to the Bible under early Christology exist on a spectrum. Uh, and so ultimately what I think most devotional approaches are trying to do is try to is trying to preserve for their audience this sense of continuity and identification that we can still identify ourselves with that community of first century Christians. And the spectrum is a spectrum because you have a willingness to engage in a more critical approach on one end of the spectrum and then less of a willingness to engage in, in that critical approach. And so on, on one end, you have people who say, no, the Trinity, you know, fell from the heavens uh, as soon as Jesus resurrected and it didn't change at all. And it was, it was the very same. And we are the, you know, part of the same group. There's ideological continuity there. And then you have others, I think, who's uh, for whatever reason are not willing to abandon those critical approaches, but still want to end up with that sense of ideological continuity of saying we're part of the same group who apply that. And so we'll, we'll say, no, it, it changed. There was development in the concept, but the, the tap root of monotheism that we're looking at was still there. And so there's, there's still a sense in which um, they're trying to uh, identify with that community and say what we believe today is contiguous, is the same as what they believed back then, even if the periphery, the boundaries are um, negotiable the the beating heart of Christianity is still the same. So I think that's underlying it, but you just have folks who are in different places regarding how much of a critical approach they're willing to apply to the question. Why did he think that heavenly beings or the view that there were heavenly beings in Judaism is problematic, despite the fact that there are several texts, both within the Hebrew Bible and outside of it, in Apocrypha, showing the belief in heavenly beings like um, Metatron, for example. What's the question? Why did he think they were? it was problematic? Yes. Why did he think it was problematic, despite the fact that there is evidence that there were early views, that there were heavenly beings in heaven? Why did he think that was problematic? I, I think he thought that it was problematic for some of the previous more traditional approaches that had been taken that rejected the notion that other deities were believed in. And this is something that's still ongoing today. There, there are uh, not a lot of them. There are vanishingly few scholars, but, but still scholars who will, will say that, you know, Paul rejects the existence of any other gods. For Paul, there's only one God because of uh, 1 Corinthians um, you know, when he says they're, they're so-called gods. For us, there is one God. But then other scholars will point out, well, immediately before that, he says, there are many gods and many lords. But for us, there is only one God is, is an assertion of, of a relational fact more than one of ontology, of number. It's not so much saying this is the only God that exists. It's saying there's a lot of gods out there. We only care about one. And so <clears throat> I think the, the point is that it is problematic to reject that uh, there was a recognition of other gods going on. The Dead Sea Scrolls, for instance, uh, use the word Elohim, uh, another plural for El Elim they use frequently to refer to angels and others. So they've renegotiated the nature of these entities, but they very explicitly are, are referred to as deities, as gods. Uh, even though many scholars are reticent to actually call them that in the literature, they refer to them as divine beings, as heavenly beings, as angelic figures, as all these other ways to dance around acknowledging that they were called gods. Uh, and in 1990, there was a scholar named Peter Heyman who uh, published a famous article called uh, Monotheism, a Misused Word in Jewish Studies? Question mark. And his point was basically that if we take monotheism to mean belief in one 
God alone, then there is no monotheism anywhere near uh, the Bible or early Judaism. And that is kind of what set off a lot of this research that Hurtado and, and others are responding to. So I, I think Hurtado was trying to approach the data more critically, more honestly than those that went before, who would say, no, they rejected the existence of all gods. And Hurtado comes through and says, not quite. They acknowledged other gods. And so if we're going to say they're monotheistic, we need to produce a different understanding of what precisely it means to be monotheistic. Although I don't think that he was always methodologically careful about um, how <clears throat> how he did that. Uh, there's one, there was a paper back in 1998 where um, he said that uh, in order to, what do you say? Hang on, I'll pull it up real quick. He says, I know this is, um, can't find it off the top of my head. I know that's uh, dead air. But anyway, he says um, something to the effect of, uh, you have to accept as monotheistic anyone who identifies as monotheistic. We have to approach it inductively. And if they say they're monotheists, we have to take that seriously, even if they say there are other gods. And I think that's a great methodological pr approach. The only problem is nobody could identify as a monotheist pr prior to the second half of the 17th century CE, because that's when the concept of monotheism was first created. And so he's, he's saying we can't presuppose what monotheism bef is before we go look into the text. But then I think he does exactly that by presupposing when they talk about one God, even if it's about worship rather than about belief. That's monotheistic. I, I think that's the presupposition that he's saying methodologically we should avoid making. So I've I've criticized him on those grounds, and I will. I'm presenting a paper on this uh, in a couple of weeks in Denver at the annual meeting of the Society of Biblical Literature, and I'm going to bring this up. So in that case, I assume that Larry acknowledged that in ancient Judaism or pre-monotheistic Judaism, they did believe that. Um, Adonai was the son of El. I don't think that I don't think that Larry uh, acknowledged that. Larry, he wasn't a scholar okay. of of Hebrew Bible. We 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 have talked about this to some degree. He wasn't a scholar of Hebrew Bible, so he was he never really published directly on what was going on in early Israelite um, religion or anything like that. It was primarily first century Judaism and Christianity. Um, I think that if I recall. He kind of towed the party line regarding Hebrew Bible. Uh, for a long time, the consensus was basically that Deutero-Isaiah, so Isaiah 40 to 55, that's where, that's the threshold of monotheism. So everything prior to that was uh, more polytheism. And then with Deutero-Isaiah, we get the first real firm assertion of strict monotheism. If I recall from my discussions with Larry, I, I, I think he was happy to accept that uh, that consensus, although it's it's been challenged a lot since then by me and, and many others. So did, um, so did Larry think that early Christians were polytheists? No, no, he thought they were they were monotheists. They were an outgrowth of uh, first century Jewish monotheists, and so the addition of um, Jesus to their worship of the one God was not a violation of what they considered monotheism. So they probably um, would have thought of their worship of Jesus as more worshiping God through Jesus, uh, understanding that in some sense. Uh, Jesus represents the deity, um, if not participates in the identity of the deity. But um, yeah, un unfortunately, I was I haven't been able to wasn't able to sit down with him and and flesh all of that out in more recent years. What did Larry think about early Christian views about Jesus in the first century CE? Did he think that that they thought that he was the incarnation of? another heavenly being or did, did he think that all christians thought that he was god what were his views on that um i think well the first thing that he would say is that we have to derive um that we're reconstructing their belief based on their practices and so they thought they were monotheists and they worship worship jesus 
in addition to God. And so he probably would have suggested that we reconstruct their concept of Jesus based on that and understand Jesus as in some way not an addition to the being of God. So I I think that there's a degree to which uh, Larry was was trying to retroject later concepts about uh, about Jesus's relationship with God into the first century, but uh, never really explicitly stated uh, that he was trying to do that. So and and his views developed somewhat over time as well uh, toward. Uh, a, more care in how the, uh, he reconstructed the uh, the understanding of what Christians believed about Jesus, but his focus was always on the practice rather than the belief. He felt that's where scholars needed to be focused. Why did Larry think that um, that the exclusive worship that the exclusive worship of one God absolutely precludes the possibility that early Jewish devotees? read early Jewish literature as referring to gods in a way that undermines application of monotheism to their tradition. Um, if, he, if he felt that there, that in a way that they were monotheist, well, how, how could this work at the same time? Did he think that, did, wouldn't henotheism make more sense at that point? He talks a bit about uh, henotheism as a, a term that, that, could be understood to be uh, appropriate to, to apply there. But because of Judaism's um, strict worship of, of one God alone and focus on one God alone, he thought that that, uh, that strictness and that uh, religious fervor merited this uh, designation of monotheism. However, he also thought that it needed to be qualified and distinguished from what we understand today as monotheism. And for that reason, he usually referred to first century Jewish monotheism. Uh, he, was, he wasn't willing to abandon the concept of monotheism just because it didn't fit uh, our contemporary understanding of it, but he thought that uh, it needed to be maintained, and, and I think that was probably so that we can maintain that sense of ideological continuity with a community to which many people still feel they belong today. And so thought that qualifying it, not just as monotheism, but specifically as first century Jewish monotheism, was a way to kind of strike that balance, split that difference. Um but yeah, I don't think that I, I think there are issues with with that rhetorical um, balance. And that's one of the things that I'm going to critique in the, the paper that I am presenting uh, this month at the Society of Biblical Literature meeting. I'm, I'm going to talk about how we're really uh, the concepts of monotheism that we discover in first century Judaism in the Bible are so different from the concepts as they developed in the Enlightenment um, in the 19th century as we use and understand them today that uh, the assertion of that continuity primarily serves um, questions of identity politics. It's a question of asserting that we are still part of the same community, and I, and I don't think that's an appropriate uh, scholarly approach to um, interrogating the past. And I'm going to show a couple of different ways that I think it actually distorts our reconstruction of early Judaism and early Christianity to identify them as monotheistic. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know what's, what was going on inside uh, Larry's head in that regard. I can only um, make assumptions and try to reconstruct based on the on his scholarship, which is quite voluminous. I've actually not read all of it. So how would you respond to all of Larry's claims about this? Um, well, I would say that that I think uh, Larry is, is motivated to find monotheism in first century Judaism because he, is a, he was a devoted Christian. Uh, and I think his scholarship was consumed by folks who were devoted Christians and who wanted to uh, feel like the a, a critical approach to the scholarship still validated their their identification with that community. Uh, that's how it seems to me based on the engagement of um, 
the devotional crowd with that scholarship and how they deploy uh, that scholarship. I think that, but I think that that uh, does create distortions, like I said. So um, Larry asserts that we can, or that we need to derive our understanding of their use of words and their beliefs from their practices based on the notion that those things uh, follow after, that their practices reflect their beliefs. But from the perspective of the cognitive science of religion, practices are largely inherited, and then the beliefs come later. Frequently, the beliefs are rationalizations of the practices. Um, And so I don't think that we can take practice as a secure um, reflection of belief. Uh, And so I I think it's a little more complicated than that. And I think that when we try to uh, suggest that belief is reflected in practice, we're putting the cart before the horse and frequently because we have a conclusion that we want to arrive at. And I think there's a degree to which Larry has done that regarding wanting to see Jesus as in some way identified uh, with God as reflected by these worship practices when I think they were still working out what relationship Jesus had to God in this period. They were engaging in these practices uh, without knowing precisely what that relationship was. And I would suggest when you pull back from saying, oh, they were strict monotheists in the first century, I see. We, I think we see a much richer, much more complex engagement with the question of who Jesus was precisely. Would you say that um, based on what Paul says in, in the epistle to the Philippians, that, um, or at least what it says in the epistle to the Philippians, that Jesus um, had a pre-existence before he was born, would that suggest that early Christians believed that Jesus existed at the beginning of time as a son of God before his incarnation on earth? I, I don't think that I would say no Christians could have possibly believed that, but I don't think it was normative. Uh, there was a, a book that was published a handful of years ago called The Preexistent Son by Simon Gathercole, which tried to make the argument that Jesus' preexistence is attested in the Synoptic Gospels. And I think the argument goes well beyond the data in that book. I think we have in Mark, Jesus' divinity doesn't even go back to his birth, I don't think. Um, in Matthew and Luke, I think it goes back to um, Jesus's uh, conception and goes forward from there. I don't think we go all the way back to the beginning of time until John. Now, I think that that concept was in circulation prior to John writing um, that gospel, but I don't think it was normative. So it, I think it was probably around. Uh, I think Paul probably uh, reflects that idea to some degree, but I don't think it was written in stone yet. I don't think it was something that everybody accepted. I don't think it was something that you were expected to believe um, because I it, I don't think the development of early Christo- Christology was linear. I think in different places, they had different ideas that were popular among different groups, and it kind of ebbed and flowed. And we don't get it all hammered out until these texts are brought together and kind of synthesized by uh, later theologians, primarily the apologists of the second uh, and third centuries. So I think it's likely that it was in the air somewhere, but I don't think it was normative uh, around that time period. And I don't think Paul's writings governed how all Christians thought about these things until at the earliest, the second century. Do you think that um, in the New Testament, when it refers to Jesus as Lord, but it doesn't necessarily refer to him as the Lord's son, like um, like in a scenario like in uh, uh, Dr. Margaret Barker's research, um, she thinks that Jesus is uh, was viewed by early Christians as Yahweh, but not necessarily as God or Adonai. Um, what do you think about that? So I have uh, I have a theory that I've been developing, and and I include it in the appendix of the uh, of my recent book where um <clears throat> i suggest that early christology developed based on a conceptual framework uh 
that was uh, created in the Hebrew Bible with the Malach Adonai, with the messenger of Adonai, who in some stories seems to have their identity conflated with God. So in, excuse me, in Exodus 3, Moses uh, in the burning bush in verse 2, it says, a messenger of Adonai appeared to Moses from the flame of fire in the bush. The rest of the chapter seems to have Moses talking to God themselves. And it's either verse 5 or verse 6. They say, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And you have similar things with Hagar in Genesis 16, with uh, Abraham in Genesis 22, with Gideon in Judges 6, with Manoach and his wife in Judges 13 and, and in a couple other places, where you've got this story where somebody's interacting with a figure that is identified both as God themselves and as the angel of the Lord. And then in Exodus um, 20, now I got to remember this, right? <laughs> I've been talking about Exodus 21 and 22 for the last several weeks. Um, in, in there, you've got uh, God telling the Israelites, I, I'm sending my angel before you to guard you on the way. Uh, you, Obey him, don't disobey him, because he doesn't have to forgive your sins because my name is in him. And I argue that this idea that the messenger bears the divine name is how they're accounting for the seeming conflation, conflation of identities. In other words, the angel can speak as God, the angel can identify as God, the angel can be perceived as God if the angel is the authorized bearer of the divine name. And that's what's explained in that passage in, in Exodus. And so we see something very similar in Greco-Roman period Judaism with uh, Metatron, with uh, the Son of Man, with Yahuwah in the Apocalypse of Abraham, and in some other texts where there's this tradition of the name-bearing angel who is able to do what God does, who exercises God's power, and in some circumstances can even identify with God because they are the authorized bearer of the divine name. And I think this is the this is the framework on which early Christology is built. I think there are a number of places in the New Testament where Jesus asserts possession of the divine name by kind of, um, you know, somewhat furtively, somewhat covertly saying, I am, ego e me. Uh, and it's, it's particularly explicit in John, with the idea being, I am that authorized bearer of the divine name. Therefore, um, you know, I do what God does. I have God's authority. I can say the things that only God can say. And I think we see this in Philippians as well, in Philippians 2, um, where Jesus is given the name above every name. Uh, and the, the Hermeneia commentary on Philippians by Paul Holloway goes into some detail about um, understanding this as reflecting the conceptualization of Jesus as a name-bearing angel. And so I think there is an identification of Jesus with God, but in the same sense that the messenger of the Lord was identified with God because uh, God's power, God's authority, God's very um, presence could be communicated via this vehicle of the divine name. So in my opinion, that's what's going on in the New Testament. And when all these different texts are being written, they're, they're coming up with different ways to rationalize the perception that Jesus is identified with God. And Mark has this um, adoptionist Christology, where at the baptism, God says, you know, this, uh, well, God says, um, my son in whom I'm, I'm well pleased. And this reflects this idea of um, kind of announcing the adoption of Jesus. John has a kind of stoic, almost emanationist idea about uh, Jesus as the Lagos uh, in John 1. Um, Paul kind of reflects this name-bearing angel ideology. And as the New Testament develops, and now all we have to get our understanding of Jesus by synthesizing all these texts together, uh, something a little more sophisticated, something a little more philo philosophical is needed to reduce it all down to one conceptualization of Jesus. And I think that's where the, what the apologists are doing between the second century uh, and the fourth century as the concept of the Trinity develops.
So I've, I've got my own theory on, on what's going on with Jesus's association with God, but I do think that the use of the word Lord, Kyrios in Greek, is kind of a um, an attempt to kind of um, strike that balance to uh, to straddle the fence and say maybe it's maybe Jesus is Adonai, maybe Jesus isn't Adonai. We're gonna have we're gonna try and have it both ways as part of the, of that kind of mysterious. Um, this is God, but also not God um, negotiation. So I think it's reflected in different ways in different texts, but but. What's underlying it, in my opinion, is this in, uh, this notion that Jesus is the name bearer uh, and therefore can be identified with God. And hopefully I haven't lost everybody because that was pretty convoluted. I wasn't planning on going off on all that. But, but in the, uh, the appendix of the, my book, Adonai's Divine Images, uh, I go into a bit of detail about that. What do you think about the epistle of Jude um, when it says that the Lord that the Lord Jesus led a people out of Egypt. <clears throat> I'll have to, I have to revisit that one um, because I, I, would, I would suggest that this is another instance where Jesus is being kind of identified as the messenger because that goes back to, uh, to the, the part in Exodus where God says, I'm sending my messenger before you out of Egypt. Um, and you know, obey him. Don't don't tick him off because he doesn't have to forgive your sins because my name is in him. So I, I think that is one way that uh, Jesus's identification with the angel of Adonai, with the messenger, is uh, bubbles to the surface in the New Testament. But I have to admit, it's been several months since I've looked at that passage, um, so I don't remember off the top of my head exactly what it says. Well, thanks for joining me today once again, Doctor. And I look forward to our uh, next discussion tomorrow, which is going to be on, um, what was it going to be about? Oh, yes. It's going to be about um, all the gods of the nations are idols article. Yeah, looking forward to that. Yep. Well, thanks again. Thank you. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.